Welcome back to Tightwad Workshop. I've had some feedback that the channel is too G-rated. So with that in mind, I went off and had a look at the statistics and discovered that we don't actually have any viewers under the age of 18. Based on that, I feel that we can safely take a couple of steps to give us slightly more adult-oriented content. I think we can all agree that this is a big step forward. A couple of weeks ago, I bought this hacksaw frame at my local trash and treasure market for a dollar. This might look familiar if you're a long-time viewer. That's because it's the twin of this hacksaw that I've already used in a couple of projects. Today we're going to make a new tensioning bolt and wing nut for this hacksaw using these few scraps of steel. Now of course it doesn't make any sense to do this when you can just go and buy a new hacksaw frame for about $10. But you've probably started to guess that here at Tightwad Workshop, it's more often about learning new skills than actually saving money. That's right, it's time for me to confess. The shameful truth is that Tightwad Workshop has been an educational channel all along. And with that in mind, once we finish the build, I'll take a little bit of time to talk about the history of the hacksaw, the kinds of blades that you can fit to it, and how to use it. But anyway, for today's build, we're going to need a bench vise. It doesn't need to be a big one. This little guy will be plenty big enough for the job. And in addition to our usual woodworking tools, we're going to need a file, a ball peen hammer, and a cheap thread tapping set. I'm going to mount the vise on this piece of hardwood. I'll line up the fixed jaw of the vise with the edge of the hardwood. This allows us to clamp long pieces vertically in the vise, like this. Now I'll mark the locations for the bolt holes. I'll drill through the hardwood with a small pilot drill first. Next I'll use a spade bit to make countersink holes for the bolt heads. The small pilot drill hole helps align the spade bit better than a full sized hole would. Now I'll drill those bolt holes out to full size. I'm going to countersink the bolt heads on the underside of the hardwood. Looks like I've achieved a Goldilocks finish there. Now we can go ahead and bolt down the vise. I'm using regular hex nuts and washers on the top side. Now we can attach the hardwood to the workbench with a couple of G-clamps. I think that'll be secure enough. Next I'll cut a set of soft jaws from this aluminium section. The soft jaws let us clamp the threaded part of a bolt in the vise without damaging the threads. As you can see, the soft jaw is indented, but the bolt thread's fine. Now we can disassemble our original hacksaw and take some measurements. The tension bolt has a 3 8 inch UNC thread, and it has a square cross section. That means we can cut and file this 3 8 inch bolt to make our new tensioning bolt. This second smaller bolt is used to adjust the frame to hold either 10 inch or 12 inch hacksaw blades. Luckily, I've already found a suitable screw in my junk drawer to use for the second saw frame. It's a bit longer than we need, but I'll just saw off the extra length. The hacksaw frame has a square hole in its end to match the square bolt. I'm going to use the factory bolt off the first hacksaw to mark the dimensions for our new bolt. Now we can cut the donor bolt to the correct length. Once the bolt's been cut to length, we can flatten its first side with a file. Use long strokes with the file and lift it off your work for the return stroke. The flattened section needs to be this long, so I'll mark the donor bolt and keep filing. Once the first side's been filed flat, flip it over in the vise and file the opposite side in the same way. Now that we've got two flat sides on the bolt, it's much easier to align it in the vise to file the remaining sides. Keep filing those sides until the bolt slips easily into the hacksaw frame. The round section shouldn't fit through the square hole in the frame. Now we can hold the bolt vertically in the vise and mark two of its opposite corners. Then I'll mark a diagonal line across the end. This will be the rebate on the tensioning bolt where the hacksaw blade sits. I'm cutting the rebate out with a hacksaw, but you can file it if you prefer. Let's assemble our new bolt in the hacksaw and take a look at the alignment. Ok, 
Okay, that looks pretty good, so now let's go ahead and fit the pin. Before we fit the pin though, I'll file off the rough edges that the hacksaw left on the bolt. Now we can use a spare hacksaw blade to mark the location for the pin. Then I'll make a center punch mark. I'm going to use this nail for the pin, so we need a drill bit with a slightly smaller diameter. This one's too big. But that one should be just right. We want to drill the pin hole at a slight angle, so the blade won't slip off the pin when we tighten the tension bolt. Now we need to file the end of the pin until it will fit through the hole. Once the pin will fit, hammer it tightly into the hole, then saw off the excess. Now we can use our ball peen hammer to rivet over the other end of the pin. This will prevent the pin from falling out. Because we were holding this end of the pin against the vise while we were riveting, it's now mushroomed and the hacksaw blade won't fit over it. That's easily fixed though, with a few strokes of the file. So now we can assemble our hacksaw using the nut and washer that came with our donor bolt. We have to use a spanner to tighten the bolt, but that's not a big deal. Let's try a test cut to see how it works. Okay, that worked fine, but I don't like the big diameter on this washer. So we'll use this second piece of scrap to make a better washer. My own hacksawing skills are probably best described as adequate, but I know a couple of old boys who could pick up a hacksaw and saw this whole bolt into a perfect stack of identical coins. I think that washer turned out okay, so now we can start working on the wing nut. I've switched to a coarse blade in the hacksaw to cut the steel block for the wing nut. Once we've cut the block, I'll mark and punch the center. Then we can drill a hole through the block and enlarge it with a bigger drill. Next we'll use a tap to form a 3 8 inch UNC thread inside the hole. I like to use plenty of oil when I'm tapping threads like this. Make sure the tap's nice and straight when you're starting it into the hole. Once it's started, I like to turn the tap 180 degrees, then back it off a little to break the metal chips inside the hole. This hole goes all the way through the block, so the chips will fall out the bottom. If you're working on a blind hole, you need to keep removing the tap and blowing the chips out as you go. If we've done this right, our square bolt should twist straight in there. Now we can mark out the cutting lines for the top of the wing nut and saw them down with the hacksaw. Next I'll mark the side lines and saw out the waste chunks. These last couple of waste chunks can be removed easily with a chisel. Now we can saw out the chunks from the bottom of the wing nut. Once we've cut out the rough wing nut shape with the hacksaw, we can smooth it out with a file. That looks pretty good, so now we can cut the bottom edge of the wings off at an angle. I've hit the top of the vice jaws with my hacksaw a few times there, that's very bad workmanship on my part. Okay, after a bit more final finishing, that almost looks like a wing nut. Let's test fit it and see how it looks. Well, I think that turned out quite well. So as I promised, let's now go and have a quick look at the history of the hacksaw. Wait, 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 come back, come back. This is a lot more interesting than you think it is. It's easy for us 21st century people to take it for granted, but this was quite revolutionary when it was introduced. Let's just think about what the situation would have been for you if you were an average person with a home workshop in the 1800s. 
you would have definitely had a work holding vice, a hammer, a couple of cold chisels, a file or two, maybe some kind of brace or egg beater drill, and if you were really well off, you might have even had a hand crank grinder like this for sharpening your tools. For most metal cutting work, you'd have been reaching for a cold chisel. For thin rod like this, you just need to chisel a notch all the way around it, then use something convenient to break off the piece. This leaves a rough end, which you'll need to smooth off with a file. Now that works fine for little stuff like this. But if you want to cut something a bit bigger, like this old railway spike, then you're probably going to have to take a visit to your blacksmith to get it heated to red heat and then worked on the anvil. And if there's no blacksmith available, then you're going to have to use a cape chisel like this to cut a trench across the material. This little vise isn't strong enough to do this job, so I'll see you over at the other vise and we'll see if we can make it work. This method's called chipping, and it's pretty much the same as using a wood chisel. The only difference is that the tools are stronger, and you have to hit the chisel harder. Here's a chip of steel from our cut. That's probably why the technique's called chipping. So obviously I didn't finish cutting that all the way through. So as you might imagine, if you spent a lot of years cutting things with a chisel, the idea of this newfangled hacksaw is going to be quite revolutionary. You can now cut your parts up very close to your finished lines, and because the blade is so much thinner than your cape chisel, you're going to have a lot less wastage of material. The modern hacksaw as we know it seems to have been invented by a company called Clemson Brothers from Middleton in New York in the early 1880s. This company were already well-established manufacturers of woodworking saws, so it's very likely that their early saws would have basically just been a tenon saw with extremely hard teeth. They were also manufacturers of butcher's saws with replaceable strip blades, so when they came around to the idea of making their hacksaw with a replaceable, disposable blade, they already had the basic design for the frame to hold it. Now it seems like the Clemson brothers were scientists as well as engineers, because one of the first tools that they made to assist with these experiments in making hacksaw blades was an automatic hacksawing machine that probably looked a bit like this one. The big benefit of a machine like this is that every stroke is exactly the same as the last one, and also your arm's not going to get anywhere near as tired. Between 1884 and 1886 they experimented with literally dozens of different tooth forms and levels of hardening, until they finally came up with a blade that could cut over 350 slices from an iron bar like this without going blunt. Once the Clemsons brought it to market, it didn't take long for hacksaws like this to become popular. This 1885 textbook has over 12 pages of details about cutting metal with chisels, but doesn't mention hacksaws at all. Whereas this 1890 textbook shows a fairly modern looking hacksaw, and even mentions automatic power driven hacksaws being relatively common in factories by then. Okay, so now let's talk about hacksaw blades. I don't really have a favourite brand, these are just what I had on hand. Hacksaw blades for hand saws are usually available in 18, 24 and 32 teeth per inch pitches. Coarse 18 TPI blades are used for thick metal sections, like our wing nut. Fine 32 TPI blades are used for cutting sheet metal and thin walled tubes like this. You need to match the blade to the material you're cutting. Ideally, you want to keep at least three teeth in contact with the material. If you don't have a blade with small enough teeth to achieve that, sometimes you can get the same effect by tilting the saw at an angle to the workpiece like this. Unlike saws for cutting wood, the teeth of a hacksaw are set in this wavy pattern. This helps prevent the teeth from getting wedged in the cut and breaking off. The very cheapest hacksaw blades are made from carbon steel. These ones cost about 30 cents each. These blades are fine to use for cutting wood or plastic or softer metals like brass and aluminium, but they wear out quickly if you use them to cut steel. They're relatively soft, and they'll bend without breaking if they get jammed in the cut while you're sawing. The second type of hacksaw blade is all hard high-speed steel, and these cost about $3 each. High-speed steel is a special alloy of carbon steel, which adds metals like tungsten, molybdenum, and cobalt. High-speed steel is used to make wood planer blades, tooling for metalworking lathes, and most modern twist drill bits. These all hard blades cut really well, and because they're stiff, they also cut very accurately. 
but that stiffness also makes them quite brittle. Our third type of hacksaw blade is bimetal high speed steel. These also cost about $3 each, and they're made by welding a thin strip of high speed steel teeth to a blade made from softer steel. These blades cut almost as well as all hard high speed steel blades, but they're soft enough to bend without shattering. For that reason, they're the most popular type available today. So that's the fundamentals of hacksaws. Thanks for sticking around, I know it was a bit longer video than usual, and I always feel kind of bad when I destroy a perfectly usable tool, but sometimes we have to do these kinds of things for science. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Tightwad Workshop is filmed in front of a live studio audience.